first up is uh, Brandon Liu. He's gonna he's gonna be talking about um, uh, innovating on derivative OSM uh, data sets, and um, the floor is all yours, Brandon. Make sure you. All right. Thanks for the intro. Um, hi, I'm Brandon. Um, I'm gonna be talking about what I call derivative OSM data sets. Um, I'll explain more what, what like what exactly that is. Um, I don't know, click. Uh, just so for, um, for some very light background, I'm working on this project, kind of a company called Protomaps. Um, it's occupied most of my time for the past few years, um, and it's an end-to-end -end tool chain for custom and self-hosted vector-based maps. Um, so a lot of those base maps are gonna be built using OSM data. And the sort of core principles about like why you would care about this project um, are that overall um, it's very simple, even though it's all custom software um, and self-hosting or this idea of a base map that doesn't have an intermediary that you can just put on something like Amazon S3 is sort of a core goal of the project to be customizable with vector base maps, um, to not involve um, a really heavyweight tool like PostGIS, for example, uh, not involve running tile servers. And the way I've approached this is not to build like one really involved mega application, but instead to do several independent, totally open source pro uh, these sub projects that are all on GitHub. And the idea is that they all interact with uh, sort of well established standards such as OpenStreetMap raw PBF files or the popular vector tile spec. Um, or things like web APIs uh, to work together. So if you have um, some sort of web mapping need, but you don't want to use one of these sub-projects, you can still make use of one of them. Um, so some parts of this project are um, a JavaScript renderer that I call ProtoMaps.js. Um, it kind of works with Leaflet and Canvas. Um, there is a database I've been running called OSM Express. Um, and there is a sort of cloud optimized replacement for MB tiles called PM tiles that I'm working on. Um, but the, the purpose of this background is just for some context. Um, I want to talk about um, sort of like how OSM sausage gets made usually. Um, so for the ProtoMaps tool chain, you know, there's raw OSM data in this protobuf form. Um, it gets turned into an, a tile archive and then gets rendered in the browser people kind of sort of understand, you know, like that's generally how you make tiles. Um, but actually like tiles are not, they're really interesting and applicable for web mapping. And they attract a lot of attention among sort of the open street map community, but tiles are, are actually like a very specific, not that flexible solution. Um, they're optimized for sort of display and interactivity. But then once you have uh, these tiles created, you can't really do a lot else with them that's not just showing them like on a map. So I have kind of a spectrum from like raw OSM data all the way to display tiles. And there's sort of this intermediate um, middle ground um, that I wanna talk about today. Uh, so data sets that you, you might wanna use in something like QGIS or an ArcGIS, um, any kind of analytical task where you might need to count the number of features in an area, for example. And you, you can't really use tiles because tiles, you've implicitly sort of chopped up a geometry into you know, square boxes. Um, and also if you wanna um, take these like just base OSM features and use them with print maps or non-web maps, you know, just using things like a, um, like things like Illustrator or just using QGIS or ArcGIS. Um, so I, kind of been talking about these derivative data sets somewhere in the middle from just raw OSM data to tiles. It's somewhere in the middle of the spectrum here. Now, um, the sort of how it fits into this context is um, I've been working on this OpenStreetMap database called OSM Express. And um, what is sort of the future or like applications of other formats you can get out of this format that are not just tiles? Um, and I think this kind of is relevant because uh, the audience of people that can use OpenStreetMap is kind of the audience of GIS users in general, which is a pretty large group. Um, but for um, OpenStreetMap experts who knows like the ins and outs of nodes, ways, and relations, that's 
you know, a very small group. I bet a significant percentage of them are like here in this room. Um, so it's more about the translation from um, taking something that is kind of specialized for OpenStreetMap editing and making, uh, you know, like baking a cake um, and making that, you know, like sort of uh, making that relevant to a wide audience. Um, so one implied part of that is you can't really deliver them nodes, ways, and relations. You need to sort of give them points, lines, and polygons. And they also might have some uh, sort of data sub-selecting or slicing needs. Uh, they might not want to work with the entire planet at a time. They might want to work with just Italy or just Florence. Um, they might not want to use data that's from one, one week ago or one month ago. They might have edited OpenStreetMap in the last five minutes, and they want to actually consume that data immediately. Um, so there's a couple of uh, good examples of this class of project that exists already. Um, one of the ones uh, that Hot was nice enough to sponsor me to work on a couple years ago was the export tool. Um, it kind of gives you this idea of selecting some area, um, choosing some selection of features on the left, and creating an on-demand like shapefile. Um, other uh, tools or web services in the same class, uh, Metro Extracts is a project uh, so like that Mike Magursky has been working on for like a decade. Um, this is one of the more recent iterations of Metro Extracts, which was um, hosted by MapZen. And the idea is um, sort of having a pre-selected group of metro areas and being able to download just that slice of updated data. Um, so um, something in that same class I've been maintaining for the past year or two, and I presented last year, um, is this web service called Protomaps Extracts. The really important thing about this service is that it lags behind the main OSM database by one minute. So instead of being some group of data sets that update once a week or once a day, if you update um, OSM, then this thing reads the replication feed once a minute. And if you grab some slice of data, you will get back an OSM extract, a PDF file of just that area. Um, so this is um, kind of, uh, it's open source. There's some nifty things about how it does spatial indexing. Um, it works pretty well, even if your um, your area is not a rectangle, you can choose a circle or you can choose a diagonal area. And it's pretty efficient about doing the indexing using S2, but like for the database. Um, so just as an example of how that works, selecting my, you know, interesting area, waiting, you know, a couple seconds, maybe about a minute or two, and getting back an extract of that area. Um, so um, I guess the next task um, tying into what I've mentioned is OSM PBF files, sort of the raw data. Why not use these absolutely everywhere? And the fact is that uh, OpenStreetMap is not a tabular format. Tabular is just a fancy way of saying it's like an Excel spreadsheet. You know, it has a geometry column, it has a column called name, it has a column called class, a column called, you know, waterway equals true or something. Uh, it's made of nodes, weights, and relations. Um, but that's sort of the data model is designed to aid in editing and versioning. But once you bring that into your GIS application, uh, you kind of expect a more structured format. And some software will attempt to do this for you, um, but is often not very successful. It might try to like scan through the entire data set and auto generate like 200 different columns where most of those column values are just blank. Um, so this um, is sort of the core task that I'm trying to figure out what the right approach is. There are some existing approaches, um, which I'm going to outline. Um, sort of a related problem is that for most people, they use uh, the Esri shapefile format um, just because that is as of today, still the de facto standard for these sorts of features. Um, but there's some arbitrary limits, mainly for historical reasons. Um, you know, like there's a limit on number of columns, on the column size. But in general, like I've been trying to build my tools around an alternative to shapefiles for delivering data to people. Um, and another fundamental issue is that the cleanup task of OpenStreetMap um, is oftentimes not very straightforward. Like for example, um, these are all valid uh, these are all valid values for the height tag. So in order for a program to sort of automate 
like the height value into a numerical column, well, you can't have these strings that have M at the end because you know you need to write a little bit of logic because some of them might be in feet, some of them might be decimal, some of them might have M at the end. Um, so there's usually a pretty involved custom tool chain that needs to be built in order to translate from you know, the very loosely defined OSM data model, which is really great and because it's so flexible, but we ultimately need to make things accessible to some sort of end user. Um, so any sort of solution to this will have to deal with these pretty common cases. Um, that's just an example from the wiki of like, these are all valid tagging conventions for the height tag. Uh, that's just an example of in New York City, you know, there is some, some great data in there related to uh, this train station, but the height tags are in feet and not meters because, you know, it's America, they're using who knows what. For, for, for units. Um, so making a lesson tabular, uh, some status quo approaches are using shape files, using geo packages. Um, there's uh, for kind of light use, there is a g.osm driver that I think uses um, a SQLite approach under the hood. Uh, GeoJSON is decent, it's kind of bloated. Um, or for, um, for like really big data sets, which can often happen if you're trying to get an entire slice of you know, a country out of OSM. GeoJSON can get kind of unwieldy. Uh, there's no spatial index. Um, so, but in many cases, you still do want to focus on a thematic slice of data, whether that is just like one sort of theme, like just waterways or just buildings. Um, the biggest, I think, innovation in this area is a new format called Flat GeoBuff. Um, I've been uh, working with it a lot. Um, and the authors have put a lot of thought into how it's designed as an efficient replacement um, that is very, uh, future proof for shapefile. Um, I'd really recommend giving it a shot. Um, it's very slick to use if you use QGIS because it will load the features up much faster. Um, it's built into GDAL 3.1 or above. Um, one thing it doesn't have yet is schemaless support in GDAL, and that's something that I hope to work on. Um, something I've done recently is fork the tool Tippy Canoe for generating vector tiles um, to read flat GeoBuff. Uh, there's also some other emerging formats that are uh, more efficient uh, for certain use cases, uh, such as GeoParquet. Um, but for now, for the I would say for the most general purpose sort of shapefile replacement, I think it's still flat geo buff. Um, so I am working on a new program to the OSM Express uh, sort of uh, project that will simply output flat geo buff. Um, it uses libosmium under the hood to build multi polygons. Um, and you can read uh, from a single OSMX file that's, that might be updated every minute um, and then output a flat GeoBuff uh, format. So this is still sort of um, in progress on GitHub, um, but I'm hoping that, you know, there is some, some audience uh, that would like, you know, that needs like updated data in GIS format that can take advantage of this. Um, so just uh, as a sample, you know, you, you can call it with, for now, just a B-box, but in the future, you know, it may be a circle, maybe a polygon. Um, Open it in things like QGIS. Uh, where's my, yeah, so, you know, just opening a tabular format in QGIS that has a set number of columns. Um, and uh, kind of, I did a quick survey of ways to approach this, um, this task of transforming OSM data into tabular format. Um, there are approaches like having a JSON configuration uh, very similar to how map renderers work. Um, they need to translate sort of um, arbitrary keys and values into some set of layers um, or something like YAML for uh, the hot export tool. There's a YAML based configuration that's open source. Um, and uh, for tools like OSM PG SQL, they have sort of a custom configuration language built in. Um, so if you follow this GitHub link, I've done a little bit of survey research on how to solve this problem or one approach um, to solving it in a flexible way. Um, so and how about beyond just, you know, GIS data sets? Because there's also some derivative data sets of OSM that people use, such as I want um, a shape file of every single admin boundary in OSM, or I want polygons that correspond to all of the landmass in OSM. And these are also like pretty tricky problems that require some specialized approaches. Um, so, one kind of uh, follow-on project to this is something I'm working on uh, for my internal use that of open source called ProtoShapes. 
Uh, the idea is to build a gazetteer um, or a named set of polygons corresponding to name places uh, from OSM admin boundaries. Um, so it's usually useful uh, not to solve geocoding, but as one part of geocoding um, or, or like reverse geocoding, because you fundamentally need that relationship between uh, language and geometry uh, that this sort of tagged, uh, those tagged polygons enable. So proto shapes can enable you know, things like searching for Florence and getting back a geometry. Um, so um, one of, or my sort of vision for building this on top of the very general OSM Express database is it gives you fast random access over all of OSM inside one like 600 gigabyte file. Um, it does take 30 minutes and a thread to run um, on the entire planet. Um, but what you get back um, is a flat geobuff that has about 580,000 polygon geometries, one for every single admin relation. Um, and the cool thing is, um, okay, so it doesn't yet do the spatial hierarchy. That's something that is uh, still work in progress. Um, but the cool thing is uh, with uh, new formats like flat geobuff, you uh, can pretty reasonably handle the entire world at once of polygons. Um, you know, this opened within a couple of seconds in QGIS. Um, and I can you know, go in and click and find, um, identify one polygon, you know, that is the multi-polygon for Italy or for Florence uh, or for the EU, just, uh, just like one big data set. Um, talking a little bit about coastlines, this is also kind of more, um, more specialized, uh, some experimental stuff that I haven't uh, quite been able to publish yet. Um, but working on an approach to uh, coastline polygons without having to deal with continent scale polygons. Um, so I, um, I'm a big fan um, of tiles and um, I've been playing around with this approach and kind of have it working to where you can generate uh, the ocean uh, using this approach, uh, kind of taking uh, all of the coastline waves in OSM, uh, drawing a grid, and then kind of playing uh, this game Carcassonne. Um, it's this really fun German board game um, where there's these little meeps and you have tiles. But the, the cool thing is that um, the, uh, so the contents of one board game tile imply what must be on the adjacent tile. Uh, so how that works in OSM is uh, as long as all of your coastlines are oriented correctly, which I have this really long diary post on, uh, you can sort of uh, take your grid um, and sort of uh, mark all of the coastlines as coastline and look at their edges uh, and be like, okay, well, um, because the border of this one is all water or is all land, I'm going to mark those as water or land, and then I'm going to flood fill the rest. Um, and then that will give me sort of a very... Um, a very compact representation of the entire ocean or the entire landmass. Um, and um, you can kind of like store it, you know, this is like getting really into the nitty gritty, but you can store it as like a single bit per uh, ocean tile or per land tile. So it's kind of a approach I'm playing with to derive um, all of the ocean or all of the land uh, using essentially a custom approach. So conclusions are why any of this matters. Uh, you know, I've drag you through this very nerdy topic of, you know, low level OpenStreetMap stuff. Well, raw OpenStreetMap data models might always be quite exotic, might always be a little inex like inaccessible to sort of the audience that can make the most use of it. So to bring OSM to the widest possible audience uh, in order to get, you know, the most value to really diverse use cases, some sort of bridge between OSM and the GIS world of points and lines and polygons is really essential. Um, and uh, sort of focus on the data slicing task, whether that is slicing by area or slicing by theme. Um, and if we can make that work um, and make it uh, simple and fast and open source, uh, that's sort of the ideal. Uh, so I believe that's all I have and I'm right on time. Uh, you can find me on OpenStreetMap. Uh, you can find me on GitHub. Uh, you can also find my contact information if you have questions or you think this is relevant to a project you're working on. Um, I'm always happy to collaborate. Thanks. Thanks, Brandon. As, as someone who has done a lot of slicing and dicing of OpenStreetMap data, I see the value in this. I hope you do too. Um, 
Are there, unless I'm doing something egregiously wrong, I didn't see any questions yet from, oh, I do see one now, let's go there. Are there places where this ties into the MapLibre tools, e.g. MapLibre GL rendering and using their styles? Yeah, um, for sure. Like for me, in terms of um, my project overall, um, I've generated sort of, so I have a base map sort of design already. Um, but I think one uh, really powerful use case is if you can use sort of a thematic export from here, you'd probably have to use a tool like Tippy Canoe in order to, to like in order to generate the tiles. But then once you have them in tiles, then those will just work with MapLibre GL. Um, you'll have to um, do things like customize the style for the renderer, uh, for example. Um, but yes, um, definitely like all of the sort of slicing and dicing is ex is applicable as sort of a, um, a pre-processing step to eventually get to tiles. Yeah. I got one more from the online audience. Um, how does this compare to the OSIM QA tiles? Um, I think like OSM QA tiles, from my understanding, is tile-based, but is, um, is specialized to, um, it does clip the geometries in them. So if you wanted to, for example, uh, just load QA tiles into QGIS, I believe that would still be tiled. So you wouldn't be able to work with like the geometries as one as they originally were. Like for example, have an OSM ID to link back to, you know, the object on osm.org. Um, so I think like, um, I think tiles are, are the perfect use case for a lot of um, visualization or sort of like very overview focused use cases. But I still feel like the sort of GIS data set is still like the most common sort of interoperability format. Yeah. Okay, that's all I got from uh, online, but let's go to our audience here in the room. Any, any questions for, for Brandon? Well, I got one for you. Oh, you have your pop-up, that's wonderful. Um, so you're talk, you were talking about coastlines and um, you were talking about admin boundaries. Is there any specific reason why you decided to focus on those first? Uh, sure. So I feel like those are some of the most in-demand sort of like pre-packaged OSM data. I think what's um, really interesting is the idea of um, sort of a global slice of one set of data. Um, people have done this for, for example, OSM buildings, like just have a layer of all OSM buildings, maybe even mixing that with like the Microsoft building layer um, or having an export of all address points. Um, so I think for those use cases of like having a GIS data set of one specific theme. I think like, uh, so for example, flat geobuff is a really good tool for those use cases. Yeah. Wonderful, last, last chance for questions. Oh, there's one. Wait, give me a sec. So that everyone can hear it also is watching online. Sure, hey, um, I'm not familiar with uh, flat geobuff. Um, and we've essentially been recommending uh, folks uh, things like GeoPackage and, you know, in the of Geo database, et cetera. Uh, could you just uh, give me a brief idea of like how, uh, what the benefits are of flat GeoBuff versus GeoPackage and those types of shapefile um, replacements? Sure. Um, I think GeoPackage is definitely like one of the most like standardized and also, you know, most compatible choices. Um, in terms of the implementation from a software perspective, it is quite a bit more complex uh, because um, it is a, um, a SQL database. So you need a software that can open the database in order to use it. Um, for flat GeoBuff, there's some interesting tools where you can, for example, um, host a flat GeoBuff on a uh, storage system like Amazon S3 and be able to read it um, sort of remotely um, in chunks instead of having to download the entire thing as like a, as one piece. Um, so I think for those, um, it's sort of like a different class um, where once you've like jumped to using a database um, and you can uh, accept all the trade-offs then I think using geo package in that context makes sense. Yeah. Last call for questions for Brandon. Oh, here you go. 
Yeah, uh, have you tried uh, this on other data sets uh, than other than OSM or is it focused just on OSM? Um, in this context, um, I'm focusing just on OSM um, just because the database tool I'm working on is specific to OSM nodes, ways, and relations. So it's there's not really a lot of adoption of that data model outside of OSM itself. Um, you know, there's a couple of like little like private private OSM projects here and there. Um, but I think some of the other things I was talking about, like for example, using flat GeoBuff or using um, these tile archives can apply for more than just OSM. Um, and I have another talk at Phosphor G next week about that if you're interested in beyond OSM. <laughs> yeah.